Hello and welcome to part three. And as you will notice, this is much later in the evening than it was earlier. So we're now under rather than daylight. We are under the lit conditions. And I think I've got it set up quite well. Uh, you won't notice, but I actually have the panel I'm reflecting light off is some bathroom panel, which um. Is a slightly bigger piece like this. Voila! You can sort of see what I'm doing. I have got a ring light which someone very generously donated to me at the beginning of this um, because they have lots of them. And so that allows me to adjust it some more. And actually, if, we, if I put this like this, you can even see the two blue lights of my camera to tell me it's on. Oh, hey. So, that is what I'm using. Yay! Bit weird. This is kind of sort of like, almost as a mirrored surface. But <clears throat> at some point, I do have to come with a more permanent solution. But it works quite well. It does seem to diffuse the light quite nicely. Anyway, part three of Lend Lease. And this time we're looking at the UK. And the UK is interesting. You know, uh, it's basically yes, but no, but yes, but no, but yes, but no. Yes, we want it, but no, we don't. Yes, we want it, but no, we don't. But do we do get in this conditions, that conditions? There's actually almost more debate in the UK than there is in America over it. And I mean, as I say, there is Mr. Kennedy, former ambassador to Britain, who honestly, I, 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 I think Roosevelt would have gladly sent to Germany and left there for the rest of the war if he could have. Um, he was, there is this quote which comes from Roosevelt, which is, uh, I think, honestly, the thing is that, Ken uh, that Kennedy would have preferred for Britain to be run by a small class of capitalists protected by Hitler than a democracy like, Euro like Britain. And actually, he's at one point, Kennedy's going, you know, democracy is over uh, because of the various things. And you sit there and go, well, a lot of people are always predicting the demise of democracy. The trouble is, that doesn't mean necessarily there's a better form of government out there. <sighs> always be careful about people predicting the uh, predicting the demise of democracy. That usually is the uh, they uh, means they like power and they think they should be running things, but they don't think they can win an election. And yes, I agree, elections are popularity contests, but. <sighs> they always were gonna be. And the amount of time I hear people say, but they should be about the ideas. Well, yes, they are, but they're also about the popular ideas. And that means the ideas which aren't just popular with your friends, but which are popular with a large number of people who aren't necessarily your friends and may not even like you on a personal level, but like your ideas enough they'll vote for you. Interesting thing. You don't have to like someone in order to trust them to do a good job, or do roughly the job they say they're going to do. And the people are more likely to vote for someone they trust will do the job they say they're going to, than someone they like, who they don't trust to do the job they're going, they say they're going to. Which might explain some recent elections, where you might have a far more likable candidate on one side who then loses and everyone's surprised again. But they're likable, yes, but no one actually believes, they're, they're lovely, but they don't believe they're going to do what they say they're going to do once they get into power. I'm not saying about recent American elections or recent British elections or even recent French elections or a fair number of German ones. It's life. It's democracy. It's fun. 
Okay, let's be honest. Let's look at some of the debates in the House of Commons about this. So the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Sir Kingly Wood. King, I like Kingsley Wood. He's a cool person. I should like, with the permission, to make a statement regarding neg negotiations for a loan in the United States. Now, this, remember, is loans prior to Lend-Lease. I'm glad to, enable to, uh, to be able to inform the House that, with approval of the President of the United States, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation has authorized a loan to His Majesty's Government of $425 million. It's not far off half a billion. And an agreement was signed yesterday. The purpose of the loan is to provide this country with exchange to be used towards paying for war supplies contracted for prior to the enactment of Lend-Lease. As collateral security for the loan, there will be pledged shares representing direct investments in certain marketable securities. There will be no change in the control or management of these direct investments, including British-owned insurance companies in the United States. The loan will bear interest at the rate of 3% per annum and mature in 15 years, provided that an extension for five years may at our option be made if two-thirds of the capital has been repaid at the end of 15 years. The full text of the announcement which is being made today in the United States will be circulated in the official report. The terms of the agreement are contained in a white paper, which will be available at once in the vote office. Now think about that. They've already spent, basically this is admitting we've spent six and a half billion and before we even lend lease any even again, and we need a, need a further four, uh, four, uh, no, 425 million. So basically... They are saying they've run up bills before Lend-Lease began of $6.925 billion. And this is before you include the billion pound, billion dollar loans of Canada, which there are two of them. So you can get the bill up to $8 billion if you quite happily, if you're talking about it, and maybe more once you talk including, including exchange rates. There is a huge amount of money had to be spent before Lend-Lease even began. Wars are not cheap. So every time you have someone telling you, oh, but we're at peace, we probably shouldn't be spending so much on equipment. Just remember this sh uh, single point. Deterrence is a lot cheaper than war. Buying... Four illustrious invincible class aircraft carriers prior to the Falklands War and announcing they were going to have full complements of Harriers with airborne early warning and maintaining the uh, maintaining the Falklands, uh, Falklands patrol ship, the Antarctic patrol vessel, uh, HMS Endurance, and maintaining and actually having a more significant garrison in the Falklands might not have stopped the war. It might not have. But it would have raised the bar and the deterrence level a quite a long way, so it might well have done. It's the same with World War II. If you hadn't cut as much after World War I, if you kept forces at a slightly larger level and kept them, and managed to find the money for it, because it would have cost money, and I, I do admit this, it wouldn't have been cheap. You might have had sufficient force present that you could have deterred or even pushed back in World War II. That is the thing. And I honestly, it's not just the British government I'm talking about that. Let's consider it the Norwegian government. If they had a few more regulars and a, a slightly larger reserve, if they'd had, so they'd had more regulars available to immediately act, even if they had gone with the telegram system, they could have secured themselves so much quicker. If they'd invested in slightly newer, slightly more modern warships for their navy, they might not have found themselves in so much trouble. They might not have got so ambushed. If they'd actually practiced those ships and got them out more regularly and actually put them on a warlike war footing sooner, it might have happened. And that's Norway. You can go through all the countries. And yes, there is a good reason for peace. We want peace. We prefer peace. Peace is a far more preferable existence than war. It is. But deterrence is a lot cheaper in lives, in resources, 
in every single way than war is. And the thing is, deterrence has to be based on two levels. It has to be based on conventional and strategic, and a certain level of nation. You have to have your strategic deterrent, because you have to balance out other people. You have to be sure you're independent and capable. You can't rely necessarily on someone else's umbrella always protecting you. And you have to have a conventional deterrent, because, well, as it's been shown recently, there's the grey zone, and there's a whole level of conflict which can go on, as it's been actually not just shown recently, but throughout history recently, where you do not get strategic weapons like nuclear weapons being used. A whole level. Anyway, I believe the House with terms, uh, the House with the terms of agreement before them, will agree with me that this represents a satisfactory agreement and once again reflects the readiness of the United States administration to extend their assistance to us. The execution of this agreement will require legislation, since the Treasury will need to retain special powers until the loan has been fully repaid, whereas the present Emergency Powers Act will in ordinary course lapse before that date. The government intends to ask the House to pass necessary legislation as a matter of urgency. The text of the bill will be available tomorrow, and my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, authorises me to say that it is proposed to ask the House to consider it and to pass it for all stages on the fourth sitting day. Mr. Vaughan, may I ask the Chancellor whether this will interfere in any way with the extra Exchange Equalisation Fund? Mr. White. While expressing the satisfaction we all feel with the nature of this transaction, which is certainly generous, did I understand the right on general to say the income for the pledged securities will not be devoted to the service of the loan, but will remain for the benefit of the holders? Uh, Sir Kingsley Wood. I think my right honourable friend better wait until he sees the terms agreement and full explanation I I'll give him when the matter comes before the House. Following is the text of the announcement made in the United States. With the approval of the President and at the request of the Federal Loan Administration, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation has today authorized a loan to the United Kingdom, Great Britain, and Northern Ireland of $425 million. The loan is made under specific authority granted to the Reconstruction Finance Corporation by Congress in an act approved by the President on the 10th of June 1941 for the purpose of providing the British with dollar exchange without having to sell their securities investments at full sale. They will, use, uh, they will be used by Great Britain to pay for war supplies in this country contracted for prior to ex enactment of the Lend-Lease Bill. The collateral includes securities of the United States corporations listed on the New York Stock Exchange, having an aggregate value at present quoted prices of approximately $205 million. Unlisted securities of United States corporations estimated to be worth approximately $115 million, and capital stock of 41 British-owned United States insurance companies estimated to have an aggregate net worth something over $180 million. In other words, Britain has put up approximately 195, 205, um, 400 million dollars worth of collateral. Uh, there will be no change in control or management of these direct investments, including insurance companies. Their strong financial position and stability will continue unaffected. In addition to the foregoing, there will be assigned to the Reconstruction Finance Corporation earnings of United States branches of the 41 British insurance companies and not incorporated in this country. Net assets of these branches in this country represents the, by investments in the United States over and above reserves necessary to meet their, uh, their policy obligations in this country is approximately $200 million consisting largely of cash in the United States and government securities. Collateral will be pledged to the Reconstruction Finance Corporation and deposited with the Federal Reserve Bank, as in the case of other loans made by the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. Interest and dividends on this collateral, together with earnings in the United States branches of the 41 British insurance companies, have averaged about $36 million a year for the past five years, all of which will be applied to payment of interest and principal on loan. The loan will bear interest at a rate of 3% per annum and mature in 15 years, providing that an extension of five years may be made if two-thirds of the principal has been repaid by the end of 15 years. On the basis of the past five years, the available income would amortize the loan in 15 years. Funds will be available to the British as needed to meet their commitments at approximate rates of $100 million a month. It's rather nice. It is a nice thing, and it is useful. But I said, wars are expensive. Oh, it carries on, and, and there's more. Always fun, though, and there's more.
Mr. Pat uh, Pethwick Lawrence, by private notice, asked the Prime Minister whether he has any information to give to the House about the negotiation of the United States government on the subject of the terms and conditions upon which His Majesty's government received lend-lease supplies uh, with, from the United States of America. Ms. Adley, Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, remember, the leader of Labour has a Labour Party has joined the Conservatives and uh, is a national government of national unity for the war. And Attlee, the leader of Labour Party, is Deputy Prime Minister. Yes, sir. As the House will recollect, the Lend Lease Act provides that the terms and conditions upon which any government receives any aid authorized on the Act shall be those which the President of the United States deems satisfactory. And the benefit to the United States may be the payment or repayment in kind of property or any other of a direct or indirect benefit which the President deems satisfactory. An agreement between His Majesty's Government and the United States Government has been conducted and concluded and was signed yesterday. The preamble to this agreement states that the final determination of the conditions upon which the United Kingdom receives lend-lease aid and of the benefits to be received by the USA in return is deferred until a later date. This therefore is a preliminary agreement. It provides that the USA shall continue to supply the United Kingdom with such defense articles, defense services, and defense information as the President shall authorize. Articles and information so supplied may not be transferred to others by His Majesty's government without the President's consent. The United Kingdom will continue to contribute to the defense of the USA and will provide such articles, services, facilities, and informa information as it may be in a position to supply. Full cognizance of all such supplies the United States made after 10th March 1941 will be taken into final determination of the benefits to be provided by His Majesty's government to the USA. His Majesty's government will return to the USA at the end of the present emergency as determined the present such defense articles transferred under the agreement as shall not have been destroyed, lost, or consumed. Uh, which is why if they are lost or consumed, you drop them, you drop them over the side. Therefore, they've been consumed or lost of the, of the carrier. And as shall be determined by the President to be useful in the defense of the USA or of the Western Hemisphere. Or to be otherwise of use to the USA. In the final determination of the benefit to be provided to the USA in return for lend-lease aid, the conditions shall be such as not to burden commerce between the countries, but to provide mutually advantageous economic relations between them and the betterment of worldwide economic relations. To that end, they shall include provision for agreed action by the USA and the United Kingdom, open to the participation in by all the other countries of like mind, directed to the expansion of appropriate international domestic measures of production, employment, and the exchange in consumption of goods, which are the material foundations of the liberty and welfare of all peoples, to the elimination of all forms of discrimination and uh, discriminatory treatment in international commerce, and to the reduction of tariffs and other trade barriers, and in general to the attainment of all economic objectives set forth in the Atlantic Charter. At an early convenient date, conversations are to be begun between and by the Zoom to government of view to determining, in the light of governing economic conditions, the best means of attaining these objectives by their own agreed action and of seeking the agreed action of other like minded governments. Text agreement is contained in a white paper which will be available to members immediately after questions. Sir P. Hannon. Will the Right Honourable Gentleman tell the House precisely what he means by the elimination of discriminatory treatment? Has imperial preference been done away with altogether? Mr. Attlee. So far as the reduction of the United States tariffs and elimination of imperial preference arrangements are concerned, no commitments are, were undertaken by either party in advance of the discussions. We have undertaken to pursue jointly the United States the general objective then, uh, objective then in the Charter. Penned in the Charter. Uh, Sir P. Hannon, uh, would the right honourable gentleman say whether the representatives of the Dominions were taken into consultation before this agreement was made? Is that like, yes, sir. Mr. Gary Jones, the Right Honourable Gentleman who states uh, who has conducted the past negotiations and who will conduct future negotiations with the United States Government on the subject? Ms. Atlee, negotiations are undertaken by members of the government on behalf of the government as a whole. The Chancellor of the Exchequer, of course, has been particularly concerned. Earl Winterton, is it contemplated that these arrangements will also be discussed with the Soviet government and the Republic of China? If not, does the Right Honourable Gentleman think that there might be a tendency to regard them as rather one-sided? Ms. Atlee, that is a matter for consideration. The noble lord will realize that in the statement made, it was laid down that the endeavor should be made to make net agreements with other like-minded governments. Mr. J.J. Davison, can the right honorable gentleman say whether the agreements are, uh, affects our allies of this country? Will they be fully consulted? Mr. Sadly, they will be consulted. That's the thing. As I've said in the previous part, in part two, the whole point of Lend-Lease was it was supposed to delete the dollar sign, the pound sign, the ruble sign, everything between allies. So basically turn the Allies into one massive war economy. It's scary when you start thinking of it like that. 
Um, that was certainly never the case on the Axis side. It couldn't be the case, really, between Japan and the Germany and Italy. Um, it could be. To, you could have argued it could have been the case between Italy and Germany, but they didn't really run it that way. So the idea was basically we are setting up almost a free trade defense economy, where those who are best able will pay for their, what they are best able. In Britain's case, it's a huge amount of forces infrastructure in, Europe, in Britain to support the war in Europe. And infrastructure in Southeast Asia, in Australia, all around China, in India for supporting China, all sorts of things are getting in British infrastructure. And personnel and British, British resources and British production. The same with the Americans, same with the Australians, the Canadians, the Russians. All are providing as they can. Then lease and reciprocal aid. 1943, House of Commons defend a debate at 12th of April 1943. Um, a Chancellor of Exchequer, Sir Kingsley Wood. The external costs of a country are met in ordinary circumstances by exporting goods and services for sale abroad. For the first two years of the war, we relied largely upon this policy. But now we cannot spare the labour and the materials to produce the export or shipping to convey them. Recently, the volume of exports available to be sold abroad has fallen to about a quarter of what it was before the war. A new unifying method has been found in the great new system characterised of the finance of this war known as Lend-Lease, or Reciprocal Aid. The institution of this plan by the President of the United States is one of the most striking and far-reaching acts of the war. It rests upon the principle that in a common war, all shall give all they can to the common task. There is no question of reckoning mutual financial indebtedness. When uh, where one ally ships its own produce or gives its own services to another ally, it makes the whole or part of the available without charge. Of the total goods and services of which the United States supplies to this country in Russia, China, and other members of the nation, United Nations, 80% are on Lend-Lease terms. At the first, the larger part of what we received from them was in the form of food, but now the major proportion is munitions of war and other supplies, which we are receiving in great quantity. I'm not using idle words when I say once again that the people of this country do not and will not forget this lended action of the people of the United States. I spoke last year of the great gift of $1 billion from Canada, which meant so much to us at the time. This year, Canada has again come forward in the same general spirit and is proposing to share her production of essential war supplies with us and the other United Nations on the basis of strategic needs. She is proposing an appropriation of a $1 billion in the current year for this purpose. In addition, she is proposing to take over the whole cost of the Royal Canadian Air Force Squadron serving overseas, which will be shortly be again increased in numbers as well as to provide the pay and allowance of the Royal Canadian Air Force personnel serving in the Royal Air Force. This is a considerable financial contribution, as well as a splendid addition to Canada's share in the Ds and the renown of the Air Forces of the United Kingdom nations. I take this opportunity, and I'm sure the committee will join with me, of expressing again to Canada how much we appreciate this new manifestation of their splendid cooperation in the common cause, magnificent in total and great-hearted in the manner of their doing. The people of Canada are not yet very numerous, and they have not yet accumulated wealth like that of their great neighbours. But their action has been on a grand scale, the action of a nation conscious of its parent's place. I do not think anyone still believes that this traffic of Lend-Lease is one-sided as far as Britain is concerned, or that we receive all and give nothing or little, but all that and have not a, a complete a conception of that we have in fact accomplished. If we look at the total volume of supplies which have reached us from North America since the beginning of the war, we have in fact paid for a substantial proportion of them. This country will actually sp uh, has actually spent some one and a half billion in the United States pounds in the United States since the outbreak of war on supplies, munitions, and the provision of capital equipment for the prosecution of the war. Now we are on our side are applying the lend-lease principle to all munitions and military supplies and services, including shipping, which we furnish the United States, Russia, China, and certain allied European governments. 
Our commercial exports, which we ask payment, have, I say, fallen to a small fraction of normal figure. The supplies which are contributing in this way to the common task have increased greatly in the last year. The whole conception of the plan does not in, is not intended to lend itself to a close accounting. The American people have never put the dollar sign in the help they have given us, and we are not putting the pound sign in the help we give back to them or give to others. Let me illustrate why we precisely are reckoning beside the mark. Let us first take our great and gallant ally, Russia. On Rearmy Day, my right honourable friend, the Minister of Production, stated that from the beginning of October 1941 to the end of December 1942, we had dispatched to Russia some 3,000 tanks, 2,500 aircraft, 70 million rounds of small arms ammunition, and 50,000 tons of precious, precious stocks of rubber. In very round figures, the value, if we sought for a moment to estimate it, of munitions that we have already given to Russia, is about 170 million. More than that, the northern waters on the way to Russia tell the story not only of how British ships and men have taken their cargo safely through, but of the British ships sunk and British lives lost in our determination not only to give these supplies, but to get them to Russia. We do not make a balance sheet of items like these any more than we can ever com ever compute in such terms the defense and victory of Stalingrad or the defeat that we and the whole of the world owe to Russia for its wonderful and outstanding achievement in the common cause. To other European allies, we are given aid in the same spirit and in the same way. We are also giving aid on lend lease terms to China to assist in her stout hearted resistance against Japanese aggression. Transport difficulties at present reduce the full flow of that aid, but stocks are being steadily accumulated, and as transport improves, they will go forward to play their part in final and complete destruction of the common enemy, Japan. It is natural that the largest amount of our reciprocal aid goes to the Americans, and that for a quite simple that is for a quite simple reason. The growing American forces who are in this country or are, who are, are stationed within the areas for which we are responsible receive, apart from their pay and from necessary supplies they bring with them, everything that they ask for, which we are able to give as reciprocal aid. Much of this reciprocal aid takes the form of services, which whose value neither they nor we seek to reckon. Who puts a price upon the service we gave them when we took over, largely in our own ships, the American Expeditionary Force safely to North Africa? Who puts a value on the free access we have gladly given them to all our important war inventions or lessons of experience in production supply of war equipment? It may, however, be said uh, by way of example that we are spending about 150 million in constructing aerodromes, barracks, hospitals, and other buildings expressly for the American use. Mr. Stettinus, the administrator of Lend Lease in the United States, gave Congress a remarkable inventory of the type of aid we provide to the American forces, and Major Spielberg. And the staff member of the Lend Lease Administration London quoted a vivid figure to show how completely we had tried to provide the American forces in this country of all that they wanted. From June to January last, uh, last, the total expenditure of the American Army authorities in making purchases in this country was no more than £250,000. As Major Spielberg said, this is a drop in the bucket compared with the cost of maintaining an army. All the rest of the articles, equipment, facilities, and services required for the United States forces and available in the United Kingdom are procured as reciprocal aid from the British. In the last seven months of the last year, for our own resources, we furnished to the American forces in the United Kingdom a quantity of supplies which would have involved 1,200 tons of shipping, which was more than the Americans themselves shipped to their own troops in the same period. We provided about 1,600,000 1, 1, tons of construction and made available 700,000 deadweight tons of shipping for American military operations. It seems a long time since the Prime Minister, in prophetic utterance, said that we and the Americans would find ourselves greatly mixed up during the war. We are all liking and benefiting from the mixture, and we shall continue it. The committee will appreciate that the total cost of all this reciprocal aid is very, a very large sum. We do not attempt to keep close accounts. It would take a whole division of accountants and clerks to keep such figures, and we cannot spare them for such a purpose. If we take the Lend-Lease aid now being uh, furnished to the United Kingdom, apart from the additional aid to the British armies overseas, and make a rough comparison on the same scale of costs and values, the committee should know that, large though the help from the United States is, it is no greater than the help we ourselves are affording to our allies, without charge. Having regard to the comparative size of our population and to the proportion of men and women we have already absorbed in the forces and to the longer period in the, which we have been bearing the struggle, the scale of our reciprocal aid help is of one which we need not be ashamed. We should not forget that reciprocal aid is operating also on the considerable scale in Australia and New Zealand, as well as India and the colonial empire. 
This is a further source of strength to the Allied cause. It's huge. Lend-Lease is not one-sided. It really isn't. Now, here is some wishful thinking. Mr. Richards, uh, then the Chancellor is holding... Uh, well, I'm not, I'm not going to bother with that first paragraph. It's just pointless. One of the most interesting aspects of the speech of the Chancellor of the Exchequer was his reference to the Lend-Lease Act. We were all rejoiced, as he finally put it, in the spirit which actually actuated the passing act by the United States of America. And we still further rejoice that the spirit has been evidently permeated the dealings of the two nations with each other. I only hope that at the end of the war, the same fine spirit will animate the feelings of nations towards one another. Remember the tragic attempts made by this country to calculate and to pay the measure of its debt to the United States of America after the last war. One of the most tragic happenings during the 25 years which separated the two wars. When America got the gold, she did not seem to know what to do with it. I hope this is an indication that we are getting practice in a different kind of attitude towards one another, and that if there are debts in the, in the end of the war, I presume there will be some, they will be forgiven and forgotten in the spirit in which the Chancellor Duke of spoke. And then we shall be able to start unencumbered by the experiences we had in 1918 and 1939. You can always hope, but it doesn't happen, of course. It never does. So, what do we have coming up? Well, I hope you've enjoyed this part three. Um, it was slightly shocking. I the first two parts were about 48 minutes. And I was considering if I could make this longer, but I decided I'd just spend time waffling. Because what was needed to be said was said in those in those um, parts. I'll probably talk far more in the next part in part four. So naval history live. What's coming? I have to say I'm looking forward to the Battle of Matapan on 26 March. Um, and there might actually be another World War Two TV by the end of March on the Italian Navy. I'm involved in Rudrak. Uh, but the Battle of Matapan. We're hoping Jamie's going to be there for that, and that should be cool. That should be really cool. But no, it's all looking good. And all lots of fun coming. So, thank you for watching. I hope you liked, and if you did, please press the like button. Maybe consider the subscription button. Or and even the little bell if you press the subscription button, which gives you an alert when I do a video. Or one of these, these recorded videos get published, or when I'm doing live. And plus, as ever, if you do feel like contributing to my book habit, the uh, office, which has been built around me, or rather I'm building around me, and possibly the model railway, which will soon be, yeah. Yeah. People keep asking why I'm putting in a model railway, and simple, it's stress relief. <laughs> Basically, it's going to be books, 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 fluffy research assistant, and iron brew wall, well, iron brew display of those bottles which are at the top of 1901 glass bottles. Pictures, desk, all lovely. Bridge. I need to keep my iron brew cold. And, um, yeah, railway for stress relief. Railway for being able, when I'm having frustration with writing, to be able to turn around and just watch and just go, because we all have frustration with writing. We do. <laughs> thank you, and uh, thank you very much to everyone who watches these videos. And as I said, I do hope you're enjoying them. Thank you, and take care.